Hey there, welcome to Church Online. We are so glad you chose to tune in today and we'd love to connect with you. So take a minute and leave us a comment so we can say hello. And if this is your first time to join us, go to farmingtonfirst.com slash connect and fill out our 60 second online connect card. We would love to pray for you and send you an encouraging note this week. Hey, we can all use a little more encouragement right now. Our plan this morning is to spend time in worship together before opening up the Word of God, and we know you're going to be encouraged, equipped, and blessed. So thanks again for joining us today. Worship our King, come let us bow at His feet, He has done great things. See what our Savior has done, see how His love overcomes, He has done great things, He has done great things. Oh, heal of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken to life. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, you may lift it high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Faithful through every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promises, yes and amen, you will do great things. God, you do great things. And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken to life. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God. Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. You conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken to life, oh Jesus, I sing, you may lift it high, oh God, you have done great things. so great Jesus in all things see the glimpse of your heart billion years still I 
I'll be singing Can I praise you enough? Can I praise you enough? You are the Lord Almighty, shining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. Creation calls all to the Savior. We are alive for your praise, earth and sky, no one is higher. A God of wonders you reign, God of wonders you reign, you are the Lord Almighty, I shine on the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. You are the Lord Almighty. I shine in all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares.
You know, it's kind of hard to believe that this is our ninth week of doing church online as our only gathering. It's a little bit crazy to think about that, really, but it's also kind of neat to consider that we were able to become a multi-site church with campuses all over Northwest Arkansas overnight. And you have stayed faithful, and God has stayed faithful. He's continued to work in us and speak to us through His Word, and we're so glad you're here with us today. We're going to be back in the book of 2 Thessalonians as we continue our series. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and grab that. And while you do, let me remind you, tomorrow at 5 p.m., we'll post a video announcement of some of our next steps as we move forward during this time. Now, if you're a part of a team, you've been serving on a First Impressions team, for instance, you should expect a special contact this week as we invite you to be a part of our plan for reopening. And if you haven't been serving, we have places for you too. Go to our website, farmingtonfirst.com slash serving and fill out a quick survey and we'll help you get connected to one of the opportunities to serve as we begin the process of reopening the buildings for public worship. But right now, let's get into the Word of God. Our passage is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. And just a reminder, one of Paul's overarching purposes in writing these letters was that he wanted to encourage this young church. He wanted to correct some error, but he also wanted to encourage them to stay strong and not to give in when there was outside pressure and persecution and when there were false teachers from within the church. As we've said, a work of God was happening, and anytime God is moving, the enemy is moving as well. He sent persecution from the outside. He sent false teachers and division from the inside. And Paul wants to reassure them that Christ is going to return and that one day, Judgment Day, is coming. Verse 6, Since it is just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us, this will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels. And when he takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will pay the penalty of our of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength. On that day when he comes to be glorified by his saints and to be marveled at by all those who have believed because our testimony among you was believed. In view of this, we always pray for you that our God will make you worthy of his calling and by his power fulfill your every desire to do good and your work produced by faith so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified by you and you by him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In this passage, Paul continues to point them to the coming of Christ. He does so because he doesn't want them to give in under the pressure or give up in the waiting. So he speaks of the coming judgment to encourage them. But there's also a warning in here, and it's a warning to those who have not believed in God and have not obeyed. A relatively popular sentiment in our culture goes something like this. Only God can judge me. You might see it on social media or maybe in a tattoo, but many use it as what they feel is the ultimate response when someone rebukes them or challenges them or attempts to judge them. I fear that many who use this response don't fully realize what they're asking for when they say it. Consider for a moment that the gospel is not just good news. It's not just good news to be heard. It's also a command to be obeyed. You see, you can't tell the good news of the gospel without also telling the bad news. The bad news is that we are all sinners. We're selfish. We're unrighteous. We come into this world living for ourselves, for our satisfaction and our glory. We violate the laws of God. David Platt says that 1 John 3, 4 is a great basic definition of what sin is. It says this, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Platt goes on to say this, in other words, sin is a defiant violation of God's law. To live in sin is to live as if your ideas are superior to God's, as if you are outside of or above his law. Sin looks God in the face and says, Your rules don't apply to me. You see, we are deceived by our sinfulness. The sinfulness of our hearts deceives us to the point 
that we don't even see the extent of our sinfulness. We don't even see ourselves as sinners. And even when we do begin to realize that there's something wrong, that we aren't perfect and that we don't always make the right decisions, we're unable to fix ourselves or help ourselves. We just can't be as good as we think we should. And even then, there's still this penalty to be paid for all of our sin, even if we could begin to be good enough starting right now. It's bad news. But the good news is that Jesus came to live the life we couldn't live and to die the death we couldn't die. He came to do for us what we were incapable and unable to do for ourselves. Under pressure, he didn't cave. Under temptation, he didn't give in. When I compare myself to that, I am nothing, and I bring nothing. And that's really, even though that sounds so bad, that's part of the good news, is that even though I am not good enough, you are not good enough, we are not good enough, Jesus was and is. But implicit to that good news is a directive or a command. And that is that if we are sinful and God is righteous, if we are wrong and God is right, then we must acknowledge that fact and respond to it. And the way you respond to God's righteousness and Jesus' sacrificial death is to repent of your sin, to change your mind about it, to change your direction. Instead of going forward in your way, doing it the way that pleases you, the way you think is right, you instead go God's way and you follow in His ways. The very foundation of the gospel is that we are sinful. We live imperfectly and we broke the law. But Jesus was righteous. Jesus lived perfectly and Jesus obeyed the law. So that even though he never sinned, he could die as a sacrifice for sinners. And by doing so, he could make a way for your sin and my sin to be forgiven. For the penalty of your sin and my sin to be removed from us. If the good news is true, if if God is righteous and we are sinners, then his righteousness demands our response. If we are wrong, then the one who is right is the only one who has a say. So in this passage, Paul warns that Jesus is coming, that there will be judgment, and that those who do not believe God and have not obeyed the commands of the gospel, which is to repent of your sin and follow Jesus, will experience a penalty. So yes, only God can judge you. But also, God is absolutely going to judge you. It's not that if you ever get judged, only God has the power to do it. God will judge, and those who have not obeyed the command will receive the penalty of their sin. Judgment is coming, but those who are in Christ have no fear because we're not going to be judged against our unrighteousness. We're going to be judged against Christ's righteousness. Paul says in Romans 8, 1, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ because he already took our condemnation. No condemnation equals no fear. But for those who are not in Christ, there's fear because as Jesus is going to return and those who have not believed and have not obeyed will receive not only the judgment of their sin, but the penalty that comes with it. And that penalty is eternal destruction. When Jesus Christ returns, we will receive relief and we will receive reward. There's going to be relief of our suffering and our pain and our persecution. But from verses 6 through 9, you might get the idea that the primary relief we're going to receive is seeing God exact judgment and vengeance and revenge on anyone who ever did us wrong, on the sinners. But that's not the primary relief. It's certainly not the reward that God promises to us. There is a reward waiting for all those who believe and obey the gospel. But it's not streets of gold. It's not mansions in heaven, and it's not that we get to see God bring revenge on those who hurt us. The real reward is found in verses 10 and in verse 12. He says, On that day when he comes to be glorified by his saints 
and to be marveled at by all those who have believed. That's the reward. That we get to glorify Jesus and marvel at who he is. In verse 12, it says, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified by you. And don't miss this. And you by him. Yeah, Jesus is going to glorify those who glorify him. Think about that. The real reward is that we get to marvel at Jesus and partake in glorifying him forever. And as we glorify him, we partake in the glory because he is the source of all glory, and in eternity we will glorify him, and he will glorify us. Here's how that works, 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be, we're not there yet, what we will be has not yet been revealed. But get this, we know that when he appears, we will be like him. That blows my mind, because I know me. And think about that for a minute. Think about who you really are. Not the appearance that you're putting out there for everyone to see, but who you really are. You you know the depths of your sinfulness more than anyone else does. But if you are in Christ, he has taken that unrighteousness and he has exchanged it for his righteousness. And one day when he comes back and we see him for who he is, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And I'm going to tell you, this is how you endure pain and persecution and suffering and even just the minor difficulties of life because of the reward that awaits. And that reward isn't seeing sinners suffer because trust me, the reward is going to be that even a sinner like me is going to receive a reward. And the reward is not streets of gold and pearly gates and, and, and a mansion. The, the reward is seeing Jesus for who he is and being able to glorify him forever, to marvel at him. However good you think Jesus is now, you have no idea. But we're not there yet. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, just don't forget Jesus has not yet returned. They were still in Thessaloniki, and they were still experiencing persecution and oppression and division. They still had outside forces pushing on them and false teachers and division within. And like them, we have this hope for the future, but we're still here in the midst of everything that this life brings. So verse 11 kind of brings us back to reality. In view of this, Paul says, we always pray for you that our God will make you worthy of his calling and by his power fulfill your every desire to do good and your work produced by faith in view of this paul says well paul prays he prays for them he prays for us that god will make us worthy of his calling i love that that by his power he will fulfill your every desire to do good because let's be honest we desire to do good, and we find ourselves falling short. We see it in New Year's resolutions. We see it in turning over new leaves. We see it in rededications of our life. We see us in, in us starting a new Bible reading plan. I'm going to stick to it this time. I'm going to finish this one. We have this desire. It's placed there by the Spirit of God because of the work God is doing in us. We have this desire to do good that we still fall short of doing. And Paul prays that God will make them and us worthy of the calling on our lives by by his power producing in us the good that we desire to do for his glory. The work that's produced by faith. He prays ultimately that God will fulfill or bring to completion the work that he had begun in them. We've talked about this. It's that word sanctification, the process of making us like Jesus. And this is no, he he prays for them, but he doesn't pray some lightweight prayer. It's not just flowery words. He doesn't pray for their safety. He doesn't even pray for the persecution to stop or that God would end the suffering. He knows that God knows what they're going through. And if they're going through it, it's because God wants to use it. He believes that God is good and loving and that he will use it for their good and his glory. The question is, 
Do we believe that? My question for you today is, do you believe that? Do you really believe that God will use all of your circumstances for your good and for his glory? Because if you don't, you're going to lose heart. You're going to give up. You may not turn your back on God. You may not walk away from the church. But what you will do is you'll stop seeking God. You'll stop depending on God. You'll just kind of float through life. You'll still make it to Sunday services when we get back in the room. But you won't live your life for Him. And ultimately, that means that we have not fully known and understood the gospel, which clearly displays that God is loving and sacrificial and good. The gospel clearly displays that God loved the world so much that he sent and gave his only son, Jesus, to die for our sins so that any of us who believes in Jesus don't have to experience death and suffering and the penalty of our sin, but instead we give a li- we're given a life that never ends. That is a loving and sacrificial and good God. And if that's true, if if Jesus is the perfect sinless son of God who lived for you and died for you and rose from the dead so that you could also be raised from death to life, if you believe that, then why wouldn't you believe that God is still intimately and actively involved in every aspect of your life? That he's aware of your problems and your suffering and your difficulty. And that if he was able to bring life from the dead, then he is willing and ready and able to bring good from the bad. He's promised to do just that. And so Paul writes to say, hey, listen, the judgment is coming. And for those of you who are in Christ, this is going to be a moment of reward. But there's, so so stay faithful. God's promised to make you more and more and more like Jesus. He's promised that when he returns, you will marvel at his glory. He's going to be so much better than you ever hoped or dreamed. So don't lose heart. But for those who haven't believed, that same judgment is coming. And it is a warning. It's a warning that this judgment is coming, and I believe by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it is a call to believe and to obey. Not just to believe in that Jesus existed, and, and though, but that there is a command implicit to the gospel that if God is righteous and you are unrighteous, if he is holy and you are sinful, if he is right and you are wrong, that demands a response. The reality is is that everyone does respond. Some respond in obedience and faith, and they repent of their sin and turn to God, and others respond in rebellion and disobedience. And one day they will not receive the reward they will receive the penalty. I don't know where you are this morning. The reality is is that a warning like this from Scripture, it's probably not what is going to break through your heart. It's not just that you are so bad, you're so terribly bad. You know that. I know that. I'm I'm worse than, than even I know. But in Christ, I am loved and you are loved more than you could ever hope or dream. God is loving and sacrificial and good, and he sent Jesus for you. So let me invite you today, if you're a follower of Christ, to pause today and marvel. Ask God to fill your heart with wonder and awe at just how good and loving Jesus is. And if you haven't believed and obeyed, maybe today the Spirit of God is calling you to do just that. Whatever your response is, let's do that now. Father, thank you for sending Jesus for us, for being loving and sacrificial, for being such a good God. God, I pray that for those who believe, you will fill us with awe and marvel. And for those who have not yet believed and obeyed, today they will respond in repentance and faith. For their good, for our good, and for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.